is really uh, dark and cold, and if you have been thrown into prison, and you don't know, you don't have any idea when you will get out, uh, you don't know uh, when you'll get your next meal, or even if you'll get uh, your next meal, and so you bow your head to pray, what are you going to pray for? Uh, would you pray for uh, safety, uh, maybe for deliverance from the situation that you uh, have been put into? Maybe pray for a decent meal uh, to eat. If you're the Apostle Paul, you will pray for some different things uh, than you and I maybe would. Um, you would talk to some. You would talk to God about some people that you hadn't even met before. Uh, that's what we're reading in Colossians. Uh, chapter 1. It gives us just a, a brief record of Paul's prison prayer for these people at the church in Colossae. Uh, his words uh, are uh, important, intercessory um, prayer words, and, and it really should remind us that we ought to be praying for other people even when we are in the midst of trouble. In Paul's case here in the first chapter of uh, Colossians, he prayed for this young church and he asked God to give them several things. He asked for spiritual understanding for these people um, at this church. He prayed that they would have fruitful lives. He asked for strength and patience and joy. And so if you have your copy of the scriptures, we're in Colossians in the first chapter. I'm going to read uh, the scripture that I read last week, starting in verse um, 9. I'll just remind you, um, it helps me as I read through this, if you've not read through this passage before, you keep thinking you're at the end of a sentence or it would be a good place to be the end of a sentence and then it just goes on and it goes on. And, and so sometimes it's a little difficult to read. It's because um, this is, uh, I think it's 218 words in this sentence. And it starts in verse nine, but it doesn't finish until we get down to about verse 20 and we're not going that far um, today. So in your uh, copy of the scriptures, there may be a period or two it's what has been put in there for, to make it a little easier for us to read. So um, I'm picking up in verse 9 of chapter 1 and reading down through verse 14. It says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of the darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So Paul prays and, and uh, he, he thanked God for um, his fellow believers. And he said he thanked God always, not just when he felt good or when he was warm or well fed. He thanked God for them always. How often is our prayer life interrupted by uh, circumstances that we turn into excuses for why we aren't able to um, pray? I have too many of my own problems to be praying for other people's Problems. That's surely not what Paul um, would do. And he prayed, not Job. He's never even met these people. The best way for us to influence people for God is to intercede with God for those people. As we look at this um, passage, I told you that um, many times people um, say when they stop and look at their lives, oftentimes people look and say, I don't know, my life has really been worth anything. I don't know if I really have any um, purpose. Um, how do you have a life with meaning? How do you have a life that is really worth living? So we're looking, we started last week, and uh, we're looking at four things that will make your life um, worth living. Last week I gave you just, uh, for a few minutes, I gave you some uh, things about how uh, a productive life, uh, be productive in things that count, um, was the first uh, part of this message that we looked at last week. And we talked about the, the fruit of the Spirit, and it ought to be evident in our lives. If you're a Christian, you ought to be able to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Not because we muster up the strength and, and we just knuckle down and, and we show that love, joy, peace, patience. No, it's because you're filled with Jesus and 
and it just overflows. And so the fruit of the Spirit comes out of your life because of that. And the key is stay attached to the vine. If you stay attached to the vine, then love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that will come out of your life because that's what you'll be um, filled with. Not from your own strength, but from uh, God. The Christian life is not demonstrated, I said to you last week, it's not demonstrated by what you know, but by how you live. So God wants you to be fruitful. And the way that you can be fruitful is to let God fill your life. Have the evidence in your life of His personality. So that was last week. So let me see if we can cover these other three um, this week. The second thing that you ought to uh, do in order to have a life worth living is to grow ever closer to God. Grow ever closer to God. How do you grow closer to God? Well, you let Him fill you with the knowledge of His will. Verse 9 said, Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You will be successful. You will have a life worth living if you are seeking and finding and following God's will. When, you, when you're trying to discern what God's will might be for your life, the most important question is not, what is God's will for my life? Because what happens when you, when you use all of those words in that sentence, the emphasis becomes on my. And so it's really not important, what is God's will for my life? What is really important is, what is God's will? Period. Amen. What is God's will? And then find that and get involved in it. Um, we think um, about having knowledge. When we think about having more knowledge, we think about going back to school. Um, however, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a different kind of knowledge. It's a, a growing, intimate awareness of who God is. A person with a life worth living is one that is growing ever closer to God. I said to you last week that um, Paul was writing to them because there were some people in the church that uh, there in Colossae that had made knowledge their God. It was the, the Gnostics, and they thought they were smarter than everybody else. They thought they had received this special word somehow from God, and so um, they, they were smarter than the average person, um, they felt like. And Paul said, no, it's really not um, what you know. It's a person that you need to know. You need to know God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he's, he said, it's, it's like a husband and a wife who, after spending a lot of years together, you can finish the other person's sentences. You can answer, you know what they will do in a given situation. And that's what he's saying here is, he wants you to be in a relationship where you know God better and better. Yeah. Where you understand what he would do. And so this knowledge is not so that you'll be um, puffed up and spout off all the things you know. The knowledge is so that you can live more like Christ. Uh, growing closer to the God who really desires to have a relationship with you. There has never been an easier time to get to know more about God than today. Literally, things are at your fingertips everywhere so that you could learn more about God. That, that you, you can, there are channels on um, television. Now I know there are some people sharing stuff that's not really biblical truth. That's why you need to be in your Bible and studying it. So when you hear something, you'll know that ah, is just not right. But there's, there's some good people on television and you don't have to have cable and you don't have to have um, satellite dish. Um, I'm picking up several um, uh, channels that have some really good speakers. I got a PVC pipe and uh, copper wire for an antenna. <laughs> I do, I do. I've got, I've got a friend that made it for me. Um, and I, I can pick up, I'm, I've got, there's some good guys on television. And you don't have to have anything, you don't have to have any fancy equipment in order to be able to, uh, to pick that up. Um, on the radio, there's some good pastors on the radio. Sometimes they're just little um, snippets of things and there's 30 minute or more uh, messages. Um, listen to Robbie Zachariah, listen to David Jeremiah. There's some, some good guys you can listen to um, online. And many of them, if you contact them, they'll send you free information. So you don't have to, you don't have to go in debt trying to figure out how to do a Bible study. Listen to the television, listen on the radio. Um, on the computer, there are podcasts, there are online sermons, there are some fantastic Bible studies that are available. There are groups on social media that are doing Bible studies um, together. 
I taught an online uh, Bible study class on Tuesday nights for about five years. I'm not doing it right now. I, I may go back to doing it, but it, it was easy to do. I did it from um, my house, and I had other people that gathered with me. I have a friend um, right now, um, a lady who is teaching um, a Bible study class once a week, and she does it from her computer. She's got six different people in her group. They're in four different states and in two different time zones. They get together once a week, they've been studying during the week, and then they get together and they share not only what they've studied, but how they're going to apply it um, to their life. There are lots of those um, that are out there that you can get involved in. If you've got um, a computer or an iPad or um, a phone, um, eSword, E-S-W-O-R-D, eSword is a free, a lot of what I'll tell you is going to be free because that's usually right in the price range that I'm looking for. Um, eSword has got commentaries has got Bible translations, um, you don't have to pay, you can't buy every, you can't get all of them for free, but you can get, you can always get King James and New King James and usually NIV and ESV, there, there are plenty for you to read from. I use it almost every week um, when I'm studying um, to prepare for Sunday. Um, so eSword has got some really um, good stuff. I've told several of you about um, a website, Christian Apologetics Resource Ministry, C-A-R-M, CARM.org. If you've got a question, they've got answers. Um, and it is, and it's not just this guy's opinion. It is backed up with scripture every time he gives you an answer. So, uh, CARM is a good place to go. Many of you are using a U version, Y O U, U version um, Bible. Um, again, it's a free Bible resource. There are Bible studies on U version. I'm doing some of them right now, but there, I'm doing some on Colossians right now. Um, there are Bible studies that are for one day, or for one week, or for a month, or for a year, and it is. It could not be easier. <laughs> Um, you, you go to the devotion you want to do, it brings up the devotion material. When you click off that you read it, it takes you to the scripture passage. When you click that off, if you want it to, it'll take you where you can read what other people are saying about this passage that they've studied. And you can share stuff and interact um, with them. So there's, there's uh, it, it could not be easier for you to try to grow in the knowledge and understanding of who God is um, today. To live a life worth living, you've got to be productive in things that count. And you've got to figure out a way to grow closer to God. And it is really easy to do today. A third thing is you need to handle the unexpected with grace. How do you do that? Well, you, you, you do it by letting God fill you with his strength and his might. Um, Paul's prayer included this verse from uh, uh, verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Sometimes we think we only really need God's power if you're going to uh, preach a message or if you're going to be a missionary or if you're going to try to share with a non-Christian um, about Jesus. The thing is, we need God's supernatural power for endurance and patience as well because it needs to be more than you and I can do. In verse 11, the NIV translation uses the word great when he talks about endurance and patience. We get the word macro from that. Macro is the opposite of micro. Um, when you and I are operating in our own strength, we're operating with micro endurance and micro patience. But with God's mighty power, you can have macro, great endurance and patience. When somebody disagrees with you, um, when, they, when they disagree with you at home or maybe at work on matters that aren't even um, spiritual, but they really just know how to push your button and frustrate you, oftentimes what you want to do is bite their head off. And maybe that's what they deserve. But God offers to give us great endurance and patience, and it keeps us from getting, keeps things from getting um, hot. There's a story about a man who was in a grocery store, and uh, he had a screaming child in, his, um, in the baby seat in the basket, and he's, he's desperately trying to do shopping and calm this baby. Uh, settle down the baby that's crying and, and he was saying easy Albert T take it easy Albert just just relax Albert stay calm <coughs> Albert so the lady came up to him and said uh, I, I just want to commend you on your calmness and control as you have spoken to little Albert here and the man said his name is Joe my name is Albert <laughs> e easy Albert <coughs> Maybe you're going through, maybe you're going through some kind of a, a tough time um, with people or circumstances that just somehow seem to be um, against you. Maybe it's at, at home. Maybe it's even in your marriage. And, and maybe the truth is, the other person really is being unreasonable. 
or, or maybe it's at work and whether it is uh, uh, whether the person is a Christian or not doesn't have anything at all to do with it because they're just downright hungry and they're, they're difficult and it seems that maybe they are intentionally trying to make things difficult for you. So whether you're at your home or uh, your job or just minding your own business, God wants us to handle the unexpected things in life with grace. And here Paul says that he wants his friends in Colossae to be strengthened with all power according to his, God's, glorious might so that they might have great endurance and patience. Charles Spurgeon um, said, it is always too early to quit. Only by perseverance did the snail finally make it to Noah's Ark. So it's always too early to quit. Don't give up on God. He'll fill you with his power and he'll give you great endurance and patience. If you're not careful when you read this passage here, uh, the words endurance and patience, you'll read them just as one word because they mean awfully close to the same uh, thing, or at least you'll take them as meaning the same thing. Your translation might use some different words in there, fortitude and patience, or sometimes long-suffering and patience, or steadfastness and patience. There's really two different Greek words uh, that are um, here. Sometimes they're used together, sometimes they're used um, apart, and when they're used apart, then they both can really mean um, patience. But when they're, they're used together, there's a very distinct difference between the two words. And so this is your Greek lesson for today. So the first word that he uses here is hepamon. And, and it's translated in King James as patience, but it doesn't mean patience like the sense of just bowing your head and letting the tide of everything flow over you. It is patience with things. It's patience with things. It means not only the ability to bear things, but the ability in bearing them to turn them into glory. It is a, a conquering patience. Hupamon is the ability to deal triumphantly in anything that life can do to you. The other word that he uses here is macrothumia. And it's usually translated with words like long-suffering, uh, in the King James Version at least, and it basically means Patience with people. Patience with people. It is the quality of mind and heart that enables a man to bear with people. And listen, it, it's the quality, and this is beyond what you and I can do. You can only do this with macro endurance, with macro patience. It's the ability to be able to deal with people in their unpleasantness, even malicious cruelty, but it never drives you to bitterness. With uh, unteachableness, but it never drives you to despair. When people are caught up in their own folly, but it doesn't drive you to irritation. That their unloveliness will never alter your love. It's a macro, it's beyond what most of us uh, can do. It only comes from God. Macrothumia is the spirit that never loses patience with, or belief in, or hope for men. So Paul says, he prays for them for uh, hupamon, the fortitude which no situation can defeat. And macrothumia, the patience that no person can defeat. He prays that the Christian may be such that no circumstance will de defeat his strength. No human being will defeat his love. The Christian's fortitude in events and patience with people must be indestructible. And that's where we ought to be. So if you're going to have life worth living... You've got to be productive in the things that count. And you've got to be growing closer to God. And you've got to be able to deal, uh, to handle the unexpected things of life with grace. And then finally he says, you need to be joyful and thankful to God. You need to be joyful and thankful to God. Before Jesus was crucified, um, he said, I have told you these things that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. This is the same word uh, from John 15, 11. It's the same word that Paul uses here in this prayer. Are you full of joy? Um, I didn't say are you happy, because you know what your happiness depends on. Happenings. If the happenings are good, then you're happy. If the happenings are bad, then you're not so happy. Joy is what comes to us from Jesus. Joy is what happens when you're, when you're full of Jesus. In verse 12, Paul says, we are giving joyful thanks to the Father. God has uh, qualified us to receive this great 
inheritance, abundant, eternal life. The truth is, though, sometimes I'm grateful, sometimes I'm not so grateful. Um, what about you? Do you, you ever take um, God for granted? Do you ever take uh, for granted what He has done for you? Paul helps us here by reminding us of some specific things that we ought to be thankful for. He says, first of all, you ought to be thankful that you've been rescued. God has rescued us. Uh, verse 13 says, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. God bought us, brought us, and bought us out of the very dark, sinful life that we were in. Um, and he, but He didn't leave us there. Because if He had uh, just left us there, we still would have been in trouble. Verse 13, He says, He brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. So He didn't just rescue us and, and leave us there and expect us to defend ourselves. No, He plucked us out of that darkness and He put us into the light, the kingdom of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. So He saved us. That's what Jesus' name means. God saves. We ought to be thankful for our salvation. And then we should be thankful for um, forgiveness that makes salvation possible. In verse 14, he said, Jesus is the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' death on the cross redeemed us, bought us back. Jesus paid the sin penalty for you and for me so that God could forgive the sins that we've committed, past and present and future. And so the slate has been wiped clean. We are, are white as snow. Our sins are as far as the east is from the, from the west. He has cast them into the deepest ocean, and he chooses to remember them no more. There's a, a, a book uh, entitled uh, Attitudes of Gratitude, How to Give and Receive Joy Every Day of Your Life. Uh, the author, M.J. Ryan, says um, that he's uh, been aware, been involved in some research on the emotional and physical benefits of giving thanks. And I found this really interesting. Um, a, a really uh, um, long study that they did on happiness and how it uh, reflects, uh, how gratitude reflects in your happiness. He said that um, after counting their blessings for one week, 92% of people felt better. 94% said they were depressed and after that week, they were noticeably happier and less stressed and depressed. They found relief. So it means that gratitude is as powerful as antidepressants and therapy. Now, if you're taking medication, don't stop. But, but wouldn't it be good if you would maybe add this to what all you're doing? Um, several studies have found that by expressing gratitude, people feel more joyful. They, by expressing gratitude, it reduced the stress and the depression, it created optimism. 78% of people said that they had more energy just for being thankful, grateful for what all was going on. So being grateful means you take better care of yourself. People who kept a weekly um, gratitude journal had fewer physical problems. They exercised more regularly. regularly. They ate better nutritional food. So it seems that when we recognize ourselves and our lives as the precious opportunities that we face each day that we truly take better care of ourselves. It makes us kinder, makes us more generous to others, less materialistic, more giving, more able to deal with stress, less prone to bitterness and envy and resentment and greed. And when you take all of those things in to, uh, together, the report said, if you'll be gracious, if you'll show gratitude, it can add as much as seven years to your life. Amen. Be grateful. We are an ungrateful people most of the time. So, a life worth living. It's going to be built on thankfulness. The kind of person that never forgets just how far God has brought them. Some of us, especially if we grew up in church, we may think we haven't come that far. We started out pretty good. Look back. You realize, if, if you haven't come very far, then go back to the very beginning of this message. Because I said, physically, if you're not growing something wrong with you and you need if your legs not growing you need to find out why there's something wrong spiritually if you're not growing there's something wrong and you need to figure out what it is God has brought us a long way from where um, we start um, if you if you see how far he's brought you you will be thankful you ought to be thankful for the rescue you ought to be thankful for salvation 
you ought to be thankful for the forgiveness that we have. So, a life worth living. It really is one that is productive in the things that count. It's one that grows ever closer to God. You ought to handle the unexpected with grace. And you ought to be joyful and thankful to God. It will make life really worth living. So where are you? Where are you today? When you think about these things. Have you been grateful? And listen, several of the things that I shared today, you really only get it by being filled with Jesus. And if you've not ever trusted Him as your Savior, you can't really be filled with Him. The first step is to ask Him Amen. to come into your life. And it really is easy to do. You just acknowledge that you're a sinner and that He did die to pay the price for your sins. And so then, it isn't because of how good you have become. You're seen as being in Jesus' righteousness. That's the righteousness that we claim. And that's the righteousness that allows us to spend eternity with God in heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, the truth of your word. I thank you for um, the words that we find um, in Colossians that Paul has prayed um, for these people. I pray that you would um, help us to have a life that is worth living. Help us to be productive in the things that we do. It is our desire as believers to grow closer to you. We, we do want to handle those things that trip us up sometimes and, and oftentimes make our testimony difficult to share because of how terrible we have responded. And we'll try to blame it on the other person, but the truth is what we need is your patience, your endurance. We need you to fill us with you so that that's what will come out whenever anyone squeezes us. We want to be thankful. We want to be joyful. And so today we come before you and thank you for all that you have given and done for us. And now as we spend just a few minutes in meditation, I pray that you would just stir our hearts with how far you have brought us. And if there's some that have, that have not ever trusted in you, today would you stir their hearts and, and lead them down a path that would lead to you, that they too could enjoy a life that really is worth living. It's to that end that I pray today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to come and lead.